Hello everyone, welcome to uh, today's episode. The title is Applications of the Psyche. And so I thought of that in our modern world where we have many phones and we are conscious of various types of programs, I thought of an approach that the human being is multidimensional behind their eyes and these dimensions appear as programs, as events of action. That means everybody is raised through some sort of cultural framework. That's the cultural program. People are raised into modes of behavior, ways to respond to things. That's the social program. You see, it's the way the human being has accepted the classification of the world they see which is like opening a bunch of programs on your phone and then needing to close it. You know, I thought, what is this? Like, it's as if we're giving this advanced technology, human consciousness, is, imagine like the human existence is like a phone and we have an ability to open up endless applications. And then meditation seems to be wanting to close these applications or a single, uh, uh, what is it, a single pointedness of mind where it's as if only one application is open. <clears throat> that means when I come to give these talks, it's as if this is the application that's open and based on what other frameworks and context the concept moves in, other applications relate. There is a quote attributed, ascribed to da Vinci, and it's very insightful whether it's accurate or not. The quote says, to develop a complete mind, study the science of art, study the art of science, learn to see, realize how everything connects to everything else, as if first understand how the object is leading to the subjective result, notice how the subject is leading to the objective result, then learn to see, be conscious of the sight, and realize everything connects to everything else. That means when I come to talk about something, that event is like it's rooted into other events in life, you know? So anyways, I find it that when a human being is articulating, contemplating reality, that's what's going on. They're going over different programs. Imagine on your Android or iPhone or whatever, you're going through different programs. You're seeing different screens of the moment, different angles. So we have the term psyche. The term psyche when you go look at it, it comes from the word soul. So back in the day, there, there was a synonymity. There was something that the word life, soul, breath, they meant the same back in the day. Not, not that they meant the same, but they were more closer linked in definition. As if the person's breath was their soul in certain cultures. For example, in yogic Vedic culture, the breath is seen as some, a big deal. But in, in normal, you know, in, in modern Western culture, we don't see the breath as that much crucial. We're like, all right, everybody's breathing. What's the big deal? But in, yog in the yogic mindset, they go towards uh, practices of techniques, uh, especially getting close to Maha Samadhi, where they navigate their consciousness out of their Phys out of the physical plane through their breath. It's called Ma Samadhi. But it is not for everyone. That means in this life where it's kind of like also Texas Hold'em. You don't get to choose how the program opens. <laughs> but you can click on the program. You know what I mean? Like you can, <laughs> you can see something in a certain way, but it, it is not a full certainty, you know? Now here's the cool thing. I often talk about pilots of consciousness, and I'll get back to the psyche, but... I talk about the pilots of consciousness and for the pilots of consciousness I share this idea where it's as if we are instead of me seeing meditators or people spiritual people yay instead of seeing that category I was like what is this what are these weak archetypes you know the archetype is the advanced communicator and the pilot of consciousness either we are here to pay attention to the world or we are here to try to pass it from the mystical angle, they don't want to keep you in the world. 
If you notice various religions, various mystical practices, their whole purpose is to get out of the simulation. The world is seen as a simulation and we want to get out of it. You know, but from another angle, from rather than us descending into a simulation, you know, through various ideological systems, we have also ascended into an ideological system. That means when I look at the past, I'm like, yeah, I did well. When I look at the future, oh my God, what am I going to do? You know? <laughs> and so that's the thing. Sometimes you can notice the program. I consider the biological existence as a program for my attention. That means there's been times where I've like, I mean like, there's moments where I, you know, sometimes go all out, you know, and I pretty much work, 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 until I reach a point where suddenly the whole system like shuts, <laughs> like, you know, <clears throat> and um, there, there was a moment where I lied down and I just noticed my body. I noticed every muscle. It's as if it was, they, they were like, you know, it's as if like, imagine you're a general, you want to know uh, what you have to work with. And it was like, for a moment, I was lying on my bed and I was noticing every sensation as information in my body. Even though you can interpret pain as pain, it's also an event that you can watch. So there's been moments of pain where I have been the watcher of the body. And there's been moments where I've been identifying with the body and I've been the one in pain, oh no. <laughs> the word psyche, I feel, even though it has come to, it has, it has become lifeless. That means it's like back in the day, the mind was seen as divine. Now the mind is seen as nothing. Now we don't care for imagination as much as we do unless it has a utility. That means you could say a great idea and that idea could be a great idea a hundred years from now but people if they don't see it now, if they don't see the value of the idea, the idea doesn't stick around. That means we don't realize our behavior suggests the type of knowledge that comes to us. And that's the elegance of the advanced communicator. A being that is noticing simultaneously as they are being an individual how the moment is also a collective phenomenon. That means there's days where I look at it and I'm like, am I in the world? Or is the world being me right now? It's like sometimes I'm like, am I me or am I the world? You know? And the answer is both. Your body is the world. Your mind is you. You know, I, I have heard the term. Some people say I am not fond of the term. I think it's arrogance. But I, arrogance, not even ignorance. I think it's arrogance to think that this realm is a prison. To think that it's a simulation. Not that it's, an, not that it's arrogance. It's just... The unknown is the unknown, and the wise don't touch it. But when the unknown comes to the known, the wise trust the known, trust the unknown then. So I could say moments where things are happening, whether in the inner realms or the outer realms, and there is unknown variables. What does that mean? That means imagine you are walking down the street, you know, walking on the sidewalk, and you're walking by, you know, <clears throat> and you see a bird, for example, you know, you see a bird on a tree, and your mind sees the bird on the tree, and your mind suddenly imagine for a moment you see the, as if, if the bird was a rock, it was a statue, it would fall from the tree, and your mind imagines just the bird falling from the tree. You see, a lot of the content of the mind is a response to the environment and then there's moments where the being is conscious as their presence and they sit down to do, th do something. For me, I will tell you, meditation, even if you never heard a single sentence on it and in this life you just uh, uh, cared about your attention and concentration and wanted to comprehend the mystery of your own attention, as if this body is a vehicle, let us say, for attention, 
and this vehicle, uh, the person has to learn how to drive it. Sometimes you got to move it around. Sometimes it's, you, you put your foot on the gas to see how far it goes to, to get a sense of it. You see control is, is assured when, once the process is repeated successfully. That's how you build control. It's like there's never just suddenly uh, something. It's like smaller battles are leading to the greater victory. So if you can endure life on a simple level, you're not going to have a problem with it becoming complex. But because people want life to become complex quick, but they haven't, they haven't uh, ex become content with it on a simple level, they feel they won't deserve the complexity. That means there could be, uh, let's say, a mystical being suddenly... Um, uh, coming up to you and putting their thumb on your forehead and being like, activate. <laughs> Yogis would do that. <laughs> they wouldn't say activate, but they would, they would do something like that. And it was, it was a transmission of knowing that just like how the human being through speech can give information, that by a single touch or movement, the mind is not limited to local conditions. There was a man who, his name is Deepak Chopra, and poor guy, you know, of course he's definitely not a poor guy, but I'm, say, <laughs> I'm saying the man, uh, um, he, he was debating Sam Harris and, what was the other gentleman's name? Michael Schwimmer, Sh Sh Michael Shermer, Michael Shermer, something like that. And Deepak Chopra in this video is shouting out to a people in Caltech, to an audience of engineers in Caltech that consciousness is non-local and quantum physics is the explanation for it, right? And that's the issue, that it was as if he was, he had a point there. He was saying, what do we do with non-locality as uh, psychological animals that are uh, stuck in a certain language? That was his point he was trying to make, but he was there just shouting that it's non-local consciousness you know, to a, to a group of people in Caltech, you see there's, there's, there are those who teach who actually they've gone up the mountain so they can take you up the mountain. And then there are those who haven't gone up the mountain or they were suddenly with a helicopter dropped at the mountain and they don't know how to bring people up. How you bring people up is you are actually re reanimate, you are re reliving your inner child's uh, destruction. That means there are moments where I look at the moment and I'm like, does it make sense that I add myself to this moment? Or does it make sense I watch the moment? That means like a performer waiting to go on stage in a theatrical play, there's moments in life where I'm like, all right, this, this is not my part. It's just the, on a feeling level, it's just there, I know. I know that I'm meant to be the silence of the moment. I'm, I'm meant to not have a single voice in that room. But there are also rooms where the, the unknown moves you. You see, there's, if there's a known being asking you something, then there is the unknown. And it's not that it's a theosophical angle of there's beings in other dimensions. Like, yeah, human being, do this, do that, that's nice. You know, it's not like that. The, the, the theosophical angle is actually simultaneously being a sort of healing process where the person can't understand themselves in a, in a more advanced state, so they have to use an image. Theosophy is a stepping stone. Esotericism is a stepping stone for you to realize that nature has a mind that is, has nothing to do with language. It's a mind of events. <clears throat> because I will tell you, nature may be building something here. The planetary mind, as, as, as some embrace very forwardly the notion of the Gaian mind, you know, that this planet is not just a bunch of atoms, that its personality is all that the human being can be. So there is this view that if the planet is building, let's say, a science project or something, right, we are, we could be the main purpose of the science project or we could just be something as a part of the science project. We could just be a part of the greater inventions of nature. Because it's, it's a very fascinating point where that moment where you're looking at different applications on your phone open at the same time and you're also looking at your psyche as if all the memories you have access to, all the conscious content of your uh, <coughs> mind you have access to are the programs that are open.
Sometimes I wondered what could the subconscious mind be. I had I got introduced to that word. Now the subconscious is like is is a state where there is semi control. So s think of three states. For example, water, the substance. It can be in a solid state, liquid state, gas state. Now I want you to see the parallels of the body, mind, soul, and see the parallels of the conscious, subconscious, unconscious. The conscious is objective. It's physical. I'm touching stuff right now. It's here. You know that means I don't need to think about what's here because it's here. But the things I you you, you notice if you think about it, it's as if the stuff you want to be here. It's the added uh, physical sub physical value to the moment. So the subconscious is the mind. The mind is semi-known, semi-unknown. The soul, in, in a mystical context, is the pure unknown, and the body is the pure known. It's just the mind that is the impure dweller between the portal. The mind is literally like, imagine you saw, if I saw a portal, you know how I'm going to enter it? If I saw a portal, imagine like the movie Stargate, I'm like, no way, is that a portal in my backyard? You know? <laughs> the way I would go inside that portal is I would go with my right shoulder first, so that I come to a point where the portal is right on my forehead and like the left hemisphere, you can say the right hemisphere of my brain is seeing the left side of the portal and the left hemisphere of my brain is seeing the right. The whole point of it is that the mind is, is, is a declaration of multidimensionality. The body is a declaration of known singularity the what we call the unknown is the declaration of the inconceivable either void or infinite what does that mean that means you increase the speed really fast in this life you go towards the inconceivable you slow it down too much you go towards the inconceivable if you as a person just stop doing anything right now you'll stop existing as a concept to yourself that's the power of silence because we are a habitual creature. Think about it. You go to the gym a couple times, you identify with that action. You don't go, you do, um, uh, be still and silent for a while, just meditate for a while. You're going to identify with that state. You see, that's why I'm saying we're pilots. We're not bound to anything, but we do have a sort of habitual relationship where we got to get to know where we want to live first. You know, it's as if you got to check the house before you buy it. You know, so it, there, there's uh, that's the ability of the mind, really, to at the same time um, um, uh, to identify mistakes and also um, to identify the solutions. You know. Just like we have buildings, we can't explain their architecture, for example, the pyramids of Giza, I feel there's ways, states of mind that cannot be explained. There's so many. And it's not that there are many, it's just that we have sparked a language, just like fire, you know, we in some sense... Uh, we're like, all right, let's 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 link subjects to objects and forget that they're subjects and forget that we're objects, you know? <laughs> There was a mystical angle where they said when God is in the room, silence falls upon the world. Because once the truth is directly experienced, if any, there is no nothing to say about an instantaneous moment of being. I have tried. Sometimes my poetry is trying to write all those words as if they were one word you know that in this life i there was I, when i was younger i didn't like the notion of order and control being controlled or being given commands i'll tell you 
I was a, I was a person who I would I didn't like language that wasn't real to me, so I would fight it. It took me a while in the strangest way that I could never expect, as if what all the ideas I had in my life were in one room, and my whole life was like a seed <clears throat> planted in a soil where I had no idea this seed was going to become an apple tree. That's the cool thing about life. It is growing alongside you. And if the world is changing, and if the self is changing, nobody knows enough ever in a changing system. There is nothing more powerful than staring in the mirror <clears throat> and wondering that if you dedicated your life to that person, who would that person become? I have, uh, there's times that I have Here's the thing. I don't know if people know this, but I've, it's definitely present in, de in developing country psychology. When the person gets angry, so there are some men in the world, they get angry, domestic violence. They release the anger onto the world. There is some men who are way more ethical, but they are still angry men. So when they get angry, the guy can't hit who he loves. He hits himself. So I have seen in many different situations grown men getting angry and they, they can't hit, they hit themselves. So that's the thing. Sometimes if you're someone who is bringing a lot of suffering to yourself, that is also testament to your good nature that you didn't want to release that chaos on the world, that you wanted to handle it within and then because the world deserved better. Do you know there has been times where in my inner realms I've noticed an idea that I was like, this is incredible, it has to be shared. And then it was as if I felt the watchers in the inner realm were, it, it, I felt as if the world was looking at me and being like, you have looked at yourself first before the world. Karma is an idea for the selfish The selfless have released the world from the storification process of their intelligence because it deserves to breathe. Because there is something incredible happens when freedom is authorized on a massive level. All the greatest attempts the person was holding back, it becomes possible. That means I thought of classrooms that there would be no judgment and I thought classrooms where there would be judgment. The more the cultural program is sensitive, the less people care about knowledge, the more they care about how they express themselves. If, if the cultural program is not a problem, people will care for knowledge. Because we would wonder what is more cool. To see something we are familiar with or to see the unfamiliar. And the way society is occurring is that the unfamiliar is declared not cool. The, <laughs> the familiar is de declared cool. But the issue is the familiar is seen already. That means those people who are suffering because of their past, it's past. It's gone. The past was like, you know, like a pizza delivery. It gave you the pizza and it left. You have the memory, but it's gone, the event. And so that's the thing that sometimes closing these extra applications of the psyche, it feels like you opened an application, you did something, you didn't complete it, then you moved on to the next application. And imagine like the person, okay, I'll give you an example. Imagine you wake up, you eat food, middle of eating the food, you stop. Then you go draw, in the middle of drawing, you stop. Then you go work, then in the middle of work, you say, in the middle of different programs you have opened, you fill them up to a certain percentage, then you move on to the next program because we, locate, we relocate in the ecosystem, because we're mobile. So what does that mean? That means it's like a wheel of fortune where wherever the angle uh, stops at the pin. So I feel my attention in the present moment is actually shifting between various ways that I have seen life as an application, as a program, be active and animate. 
So now we are wondering about the mechanism of the psyche. You see, we are creatures that use machines. And to study the mechanics of something means to study how it works. This is why you can have a psychologist look at a human being as if they're looking at a car engine. And you can have a psychologist that looks at a human being as if they are not a person of, they are not the lifeless looking at the lifeless. Or the lifeless looking at life. That's the thing, that it's like the author's pen on the empty page. That joy is how you move, not per se what is in the movement, the content of the movement. There is no greater motivational speaker than the hour than the sands of the hourglass falling. The hourglass of mortality is your greatest uh, your mortality, the true direct experience of how you notice yourself as a temporary being is the greatest evocation of value because what the mind is doing is it's trying. Intelligence is trying. And when people haven't realized that every moment happens once, you know, when I give a talk, it's not as if like the talk can rewind. The talk goes forth. So when you look at this life, we're not designed to pay attention to the past. We are designed to keep going forward whatever the t intelligence is. That means, sure, if you storify yourself, if you say, I'm a certain kind of human being in a certain kind of situation, then, oh yeah, everybody needs to cry for you or uh, smile uh, for you. But you're going to see that this life requires the emergence of the new, and that is wisdom. Wisdom is through emptiness seeing what else can be. That means any moment where I see a problem, I don't try to solve the problem. I try to look at it first. I try to see what is the design. What is here? Are we just being human beings that want, to, want something more without realizing its value? It's as if somebody wants to climb a mountain, let's say a mystic's mountain, and the person's like, why? You know, that means I like to see a guru in the future where people come to the guru, the guru's like, why are you here? Why are you here? And the person is going to be like to the guru, you mean why is the idea of me here? You know, the you or the I thought? And the guru is like, no, why are you here? Why are you on my porch? <laughs> <coughs> like, <laughs> I'm telling you, we are just human beings. We're just creatures stumbling our way to the next phase of our evolution. What teacher?
what student? Are you the same student? Are you the same, you know, to have the same teacher in life? Or do you think the teacher is the same teacher that you can assume there is a teacher in the world? There is intelligence, yet how it relates to the person or is personalized, it depends on your inner realms. And it's archetype based. What does that mean? Archetypes are like the alphabet for roles of the characters in the story of your life you have extracted. So what does that mean? That means <clears throat> Jordan Peterson, this incredible speaker, he was talking about the narrative value of religion and the ethos, how the story has served man in different ways. <clears throat> For example, the story to the outer realms, I mean, uh, Jordan Peterson doesn't say inner realms, outer realms. Nobody speaks like that, guys. I just, I'm trying to speak like that until it catches on, until people realize that we shouldn't fear what's behind our eyes. We should master it. Not master it with ideology, but to watch the world from the most observant angle. Jordan Peterson said that the reason Christ used the archetype of the Father, <clears throat> said God was a Father, the notion of the Father, the, <clears throat> the Divine Father, it was a sort of as if that was the alphabet, that was the archetype that was there, that was the symbol, that was the word for it, you know? At that time. And then we had someone such as Freud even before Carl Jung. I mean, Carl Jung was a... Freud was a significant figure in his life. But Carl Jung, or sorry, Freud, has this saying where he says, God is dad. And of course, Freud is an atheist psychoanalyst. He even created the term, I believe. Or no, I don't think he created the term. I don't know. But um, Freud pretty much was saying the same way people want God in this world, as long as they fear death, they want something else to come and do the work of life for them. Which in some sense, it was a detachment from the notion of our, the emptiness of the self being the divine will to the grounding of the emptiness of the self as emptiness. I feel what we haven't considered is that we are not speaking one language that the mind is simultaneously being alive in many ways to itself. So the thing is, like, if the times in any civilization, in any species, on any other planet, any evolving similar to the human algorithm of evolution kind of species, <coughs> What it means is that the unconscious is becoming conscious. Everybody has proof of this, which is evolution. The unconscious is becoming conscious. Now, the mystical angle, the metaphysical angle, is that there was a consciousness, there was an awareness, not per se consciousness that is form-based, but there was an awareness Prior, it's as if the argument from one angle, the materialistic angle, is there was matter before there was mind. From the other angle is there was unknown mind before there was known matter. <clears throat> so all the debates happening in, in the world, all the language wars were just because 
is did it, did it, was it known or was it unknown? The cause. That's the whole thing. If the cause had will, if we look at the emptiness of the cosmos and we think there is a creator, technically that's the, that's the mind of the universe. <clears throat> but if we see there is no creator, then emptiness is emptiness. Emptiness has no owner. But emptiness in the religious or uh, monotheistic or creator mindset has an owner. So emptiness cannot be just emptiness. This is why religion is, has been expanding. People, even though there has been a lot of a discussion of trying to ground things in rationality, but the reason is religion has been growing because it gives an, a, a, an access to the cultural program to have the unknown. It brings the unknown into the cultural program. That means it's kind of like asking what kind of life is more fun. A life where divine miracles are surprising you, a narrative like that, or a life where everything is known and calculated and it's as if the seed already knows how it's going to be a tree. I'm saying that there is an attributeless language of the presence of energy being conscious prior to there is the personality and behavior. The world is still unknown. It's an interesting time to be alive. Whoever is listening, you know this. This is YouTube is something that <clears throat> I saw it as such a blessing that I was like, "All right, this is an opportunity. It's a rare opportunity. It's as if we have we have a global stage for the first time, a digital global stage." Because when we think about the utility, when we try to wonder about, all right, why, is, why, why are ideological systems valuable? They are valuable as they help continue the moment. So, our phones have an airplane mode. When I speak about the pilot of consciousness navigating as the whole plane of existence, that's the airplane mode of the psyche. Pretty much either the moment is moving you or you are moving the moment. If you move the moment, you can give it language, definition, declare it as your consciousness. If, the, if you're not moving the moment, you can only remain as the watcher of it. So people are either being humble watchers of the realm or they're actually participating as the soul of the moment. Because there's a narrative where you're a temporary being and yeah, eternal continuity of humanity. But then there's that you are an eternal being and that means now it's as if we, the Zen masters are saying, all right, higher dimensional beings that are beyond time and form. Now you need to be mindful to time and form as you journey through it, you know? So it's as if you're, it's hilarious. It's as if your mind being the uh, your idea of self being <clears throat> uh, mindful of your body and your on it's like the the semi it's like the mind being mindful of the body and the soul being mindful of the mind charles says in the chat section this is a participatory participatory universe yes Yes, I, I agree 100%. That's a very well way of saying it, Charles. But I'll tell you that it's not just participatory. It's event evocation. So I have this strange feeling that the, the, our inner realms are becoming more like matter and our outer realms are becoming more like mind. <clears throat> I feel we are going through a shift. 
you see the caterpillar is a creature that has multiple legs. Multiple legs. Like it's like it's like sometimes I look at a caterpillar, I'm like, why did the, does this poor creature need so many legs? Imagine a caterpillar. I wrote a poem even about this. The caterpillar shouting at the sky, God, why do I have so many legs? And I'm so small. What's the point? What's the point of have, having so many lifetimes? But check this out. The caterpillar is suffering if it wants to be a butterfly. But if it wants to be a caterpillar, life is joyful. The caterpillar goes into the cocoon. The human being has become conscious through the linguistic simulation and the use of language. Language, language is our cocoon, as if we were caterpillars. The caterpillar, upon going into the cocoon, what happens? The caterpillar's cells begin decaying, begin dying. The cells begin leaving the realm. As the last cell of the caterpillar leaves, the first cell of the butterfly enters the plane of existence. As the first cell of the, of the butterfly begins, then the butterfly emerges. That means language is like a cocoon where we transform in and then we step out of. Knowledge is transforming us. Those people who thought they had knowledge, it's like, what is it? You think knowledge is like a, you're going to the grocery store and throwing stuff in your cart? That's not knowledge. Knowledge is daring to look at a world that you're in. <clears throat> and you see this girl's face in the wallpaper I found on some random website? This, this picture? This is the moment, I don't know, what what show this is from but the, I could see in the eyes of the illustrator <laughs> I could see the character is struggling with how the moment should go forth and sometimes when there's too many applications open that's the value of meditation meditation was never about not having thoughts it's impossible let me tell you why it's impossible. Because thoughts are not your choice. They're like weather. Somebody comes and tells you a bad story, you start suddenly, or a sad story, you start crying. Was that your choice? No. They, the picture arose, was evoked in your inner realms, there was a response. <clears throat> so when the human being uh, uh, smartens up, becomes street smart, as mi in mystically speaking, you become mystically street smart, you're noticing attention as where phenomena is, emerges in value and meaning. Your attention is the only secret you need to go after in this world. How it works. I'm telling you, if you think you're a thought, it's super easy. It's super easy to be manipulated when you think you're a thought. Somebody could come and tell you the opposite of the thought you think and you get angry. There you go. You got manipulated. This is why we have to honor the breath that has come to be the attention of our sight. So the caterpillar suffers if it's not a butterfly and wants to be a butterfly. And the butterfly suffers if it thinks it's a caterpillar when it's flying In the sky so it's a shame it's hard to watch a caterpillar want to be a butterfly and a butterfly that thinks it's a caterpillar it's hard to watch a, a, a lion that thinks it's a sheep and also it's hard to watch a sheep that thinks also it's a lion why because certainty is strength there is nothing cooler in this world than advancement nothing is 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 more uh, the purpose of manifestation is built to ad infinitum what else can it mean what else can an endless uh, empty page waiting for our words mean i feel that the religious mind treated this world as a book 
I feel this world is a notebook. That in its emptiness, there's the authorization of free will. As if, it, you know, the, the human being found an audience, imagine from a monotheistic context, with the Creator. And the human being is like, why did you draw this? Shouting this out to God. Why did you set this in motion? Why this? And imagine a voice came from above the clouds. Don't question the masterpiece until it is finished. That is the work of eons into the work of the instant. There are instantaneous beings. Instantaneity is synonymous with timelessness because there is no other moment to refer to to have time. So if our psychology can be applied to the moment where it's valuing everything as an instant of occurrence, it cannot suffer because it chooses how it suffers. You know, it's like how Epictetus, this great Stoic said, we suffer not from the events inside our lives. The events in our lives. We suffer, from, we, we suffer not from the events in our lives, but from the judgments we have about them. That's the thing. You, you never suffer when somebody comes and speaks to you. That's just sound. That's just sound entering your, your ear. You suffer when you are interpreting something with expectation. So I will tell you, mastery runs to the unexpected mind, to the mind that doesn't have expectations because everything is now. The journey is now. Any greatness or glory or whatever, it's now. Where else can you find it? The now is so now that it's like it's everything is already one. A perfect reverse symmetry. We thought the universe made a mistake. We feel we are the bastard children of the cosmos. That we don't know where we came from. We don't know who our parents were. Or sorry, we, we weren't intended. We were a mistake or an accident. But you will see, regardless, man grabs his meaning. The same way your hand reaches for the cup in the cupboard to fill it up with water, that's the same way this life needs to be lived. You have to reach for the potentials you see or they fade in your inner realms. You have to actualize or what happens is time decides for you. There was moments in my youth where because I distrusted my own expression into the world, I did not, I was not the justifier of my will. It was as if, I, it was hilarious. When I look at my youth, I'm like, was I doubt incarnate? Like, what was, <laughs> like I was doubting every, I, I, I was distrusting everything. I, I hadn't cared for the world enough for the real world to be a real person in it. I was still playing games of abstraction until I realized a neutrality. Until I realized energy is just being aware instantaneously. There is no language to give that meaning. The instantaneous uh, has dodged the bullets of language. Nature doesn't make mistakes. Man can uh, cry over his mistakes as much as he wants. <clears throat> the caterpillar, the, as the butterfly emerges from the cocoon, the butterfly is not the same being to have the same expression. I feel strangely ther the first law of thermodynamics and the concept of the transmigrating soul between lifetimes is the same. Same design. They have the same geometry.
that energy cannot be created or destroyed, yet it changes from form to form. Like, that's an incredible question, that which we will never know the answer to unless super advanced technology somehow is found. We will never know the answer to this if the caterpillar, if the consciousness of the butterfly has access to the memories of the caterpillar or it's even the caterpillar. Imagine it's like instead the butterfly's attitude and instead of being like, oh my God, I'm a new being, the bug, but the, it, it's still being the caterpillar. Oh my God, I'm a butterfly. Like it has access to its previous context. I feel it does. I feel that the legs of the butterfly may be less, but they are stronger, more experienced. So that was the fascinating thing. I'm like, oh my God, it takes a human being, the Homo sapien, four billion years to evolve to get here, but it took the caterpillar a very short time to completely transform into a different being. Literally, the caterpillar for me is the most mysterious creature. It is the creature that is, in some sense, born with a certain design, then dies with, a, in some sense, different design. Ends up with a different design. But you see, for example, eagles, they are born with designed to fly. But the caterpillar is not an intelligence that is designed to fly at first. It transforms. So if we don't have wings, we require a metamorphosis. And that metamorphosis would be like this psychological kind of the whole species sitting in one room and being like, all right, do we want jetpacks? Like if everybody had these advanced like non like fire-based jetpacks, everybody would be jumping around like grasshoppers to work. And it would be a sort of safety. Do you know what I mean? Like you could be like um you know a girl walking in a bad neighborhood and suddenly you see something weird and you turn on your jetpack and get out of there. You know, or you run. You know? So I'm saying <laughs> right now. The butterfly, the advanced communicator is the caterpillar, or I say it in my school of thought, you think, as the advanced communicator is the stewardess, is the stewardess, the hosts, the hosts on the, in the airplane. Imagine you're sitting on an airplane, those people will come and say apple juice or orange juice. Now the advanced communicators are coming to people and are like, materialism, immaterialism, <laughs> you know? And then there are those who are pilots. The pilots fly solo, or at least with a co-pilot. That means uh, those people like Nikola Tesla, he was a pilot. I mean, everybody is a pilot as attention, of course. But I'm saying in, the, in, in, a, in a certain cultural framework of establishing the idea, you are piloting the plane of existence. You're in the driver's seat. The advanced communicator is not in the driver's seat. The advanced communicator is noticing the advanced communicator of the uh, advanced communication of the universal sector, how it's advancing and sharing it. But the pilot is bringing the new. The pilot is, is it's like different chess pieces. You know, one chess piece is going first. The pilot uh, is, uh, is familiar with the unknown. The advanced communicator is unfamiliar with the unknown. That's why communication is advanced. So think of it this way, that right now we are known creatures in an unknown world and just like the butterfly, just like the caterpillar had access to, was here to experience two-dimensional uh, uh, trans uh, uh, mobility, now it has access to three-dimensional mobility. So we are right now known creatures in unknown world, I feel there may be a flipperoo. I, may, I feel that we're going to become known worlds of unknown creatures. I feel we are, our thoughts could potentially be uh, the same energy of all those who have lived here before. That means if we take the notion that energy can't die, it's literally saying if the universe is made of energy, the universe can't be created or destroyed. Or the, what we think is the universe being created is just the potential energy becoming kinetic. So the Big Bang is a comment, not per se on the energetic constitution, on what energy means, it's on what happens to energy through time. It's a cooling down process. For me, the Big Bang is literally as if 
from an unknown uh, from an unknown source this these clay sculptures were put in a furnace and throughout time cooled down to be the statues they are the celestial objects they are <clears throat> for me there is two angles people have to be mindful this is why I am not taking people to uh, um, nothingness or emptiness I am not I am I am uh, bringing forth a school of thought that is like we understand the value of silence and stillness yet we become the new the new is the only way that neither silence or movement a, a silence or sound defined you that's the cool thing about this life. That's why it makes sense for us to be individuals because we have access to direct experience. But in a collective system, as a system becomes more collective, we become an indirect experience. Do you know this is why so many people, it's easy for them to hate civilization because civilization doesn't see them. Civilization doesn't value them. It's like an employee who the employer doesn't care about. That employer is an idiot and so is the employee, do you know, for staying there, you know? That means if you're working somewhere, you people have to judge the manager as much as the manager is judging the people. That's how systems update. Do you want an employee that updates your company or do you want an employee that just doesn't think and is a robot? Any person working at their job in a robotic way, just know that your job can be replaced. But if you can provide a kind of work that is your unique, as if your DNA was a unique instrument and you found a way to play its melody, I am telling you, even Matsuo Basho said, the journey itself is my uh, home. And Alan Watts even makes this point clear. You don't listen to a song just to hear the ending. You don't live a life just to be happy at the end. We have to increase the quality of living because that's evolution. If we don't, that's a huge sign we're not evolving. If you go somewhere and you see a system is not updated, it hasn't evolved. That means no conscious, caring human being has entered that room to update it. Because help is the freest thing. It's the least energy thing you can do. In inner realms. That means it's so much easier to speak than if I was to write down my talks, I, it, would be, it, it, will, it wouldn't be possible. Like a reason I honestly feel I was drawn to these talks is because I, 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 I had I, more to say than I could write. So the writing, my, my hand couldn't catch up with the speed if I was to just write down what I wanted to say. That's the power of the voice. It makes the silent cosmos have some potential for meaning. There is no greater game to play than to build an advanced civilization. Eight billion creatures on a rock. Now, here's the cool thing. We thought we were just physical. Now we know we're not physical because there's the administration of the mind, attention, selfhood, individualism, meaning, you know. That means for me it's hilarious. It's like, you know how much of language and knowledge is not physical? All, every idea, every word, it's not physical. So language, like the philosophy of materialism, like the philosophy itself is not material. <laughs> the angle is not material. Even though you can see this realm as just atoms hovering in the middle of nowhere. For me, it's that if you have the opportunity to uh, advance, go for it. Go for it. Because sometimes you got to make decisions for yourself and sometimes you got to make decisions for your future self, but your future self, if you're wise, is the whole species. It's the, it's the effort of every uh, uh, 
pair of stargates on the face of the Homo sapien. So guys, you think says, please know, MW, I'm eternally grateful for these talks you give. Thanks, man. But I would be eternally grateful if you just see the word great and full. That the whole point of this being here is to fully experience the dimensions of life. It is only tasks that surpass the archetype that can take the archetype out of perversion. Out of dissension, out of a dis. I don't. When I say perversion, I'm saying it in. I should say pertur perturbation. Okay, something being disturbed. That means it's like as if think as if there's no good and bad people. There's just creatures that are getting disturbed. If they get disturbed too much, they go apeshit. You know. If they don't get disturbed too much, they they be they are a functional citizen in society. You know, because I'm telling you, as someone who's. Um, I was attending film school downtown Toronto and I can tell you that I would observe people and let me tell you what the issue was. It was the person had lost too many battles to know what victory meant. That's the issue. What it, with a human being is not designed to endlessly lose. You know what I, how I see every human being psychology? Literally unknown hands drawing a picture. Now, if the person has more chaos, chaos enter the moment, then they don't finish their picture. And the worst thing you can do in this life is to stop drawing your picture. Even though I'm saying we're not more than thought, but it, it, I'm saying language is an advanced technology. You know, ideology, ideology, there was a per person I very honor. Um, his name is Terence McKenna. And um, <clears throat> he, said, he said a sentence where he said, culture and ideology are not your friends. But just because they are not your friends doesn't mean they don't have a value to the system. Just because someone is your enemy doesn't mean that person is not helping others. <clears throat> like even you had it in, in the movie Godfather. The guy was like a Italian mafia, but then he would take care of the neighborhood. You know, it was. But of course, you can't do chaos and think that life is just going to be ordered. You can't be a chaos. You can't be an animal and then try to be a human being. That's the important thing. That means it's like, this is why I'm saying dictators weren't hugged enough as children. When you hug a child, that the child, whatever is going on in the psychology is like, okay, it's okay. Sometimes I feel that people don't have any problem. They don't have any sort of uh, illness. It's just that they haven't realized it's okay for them to be how they are. And because they haven't noticed it's okay, they don't accept themselves, they don't be, they are not themselves. Sri Nisargadat Maharaj, he gave a simple algorithm any human being can use. He said pretty much this is what goes on. Wake up, know yourself, be yourself. That's, the, that's an approach to the day. You wake up to a realm, to a landscape of design, you know yourself, you observe the landscape, and as you have observed it, the knowing is in the system as you engage.
you know, this is a strange thing to say, but just to contribute to metaphysical imagery, the metaphysical database of potential ways that physical reality can be, Metaphysics is like the what-ifs of all what-ifs, of all physical what-ifs. I have had moments in this life, I experienced one occasion, um, 2011, before I had given these talks, before I had decided to actually look at my life. I had an experience, I'm, I'm going to spare you the details, but... Pretty much in that experience, I felt I was being looked down upon by my inner realms. That means imagine you're a great violinist, but you couldn't be on time for like a show, you know, and suddenly everybody who had came to that event was like, hey man, you failed. It was as if I felt a shame from my inner realms. I felt the inner realms as if was like my older brother, I felt like my, the way the intelligence of the moment came across in that specific experience, it was as if my inner realms <clears throat> were looking down on my, uh, on me. I felt pretty much, it, I felt the gods were looking down on me and it was a, the logos. And in that moment, I broke down crying. You know, grown human being, completely stable. Usually I'm a stable guy. But in that instant, in 2011, before I was, it was a sort of breaking of the soul, as if the mind had failed its soul. The mind had maybe taken care of the body. The body and the mind were like, yeah, we got this. You know, but it was, you know what it was? It was like the Bhagavad Gita says, uh, the soul is the person in the chariot. The mind is the chariot driver and the body is the horses. Hedonism, it, it was like that desire of mine that I felt I had, I had, my soul had descended through those decisions. It was a sort of experience where the chariot driver and the horses were happy. The chariot, decided, the chariot driver had decided to go somewhere, you know, but it wasn't where the person in the chariot wanted it. It was as if my mind was, my mind and body, it was all good, it was all functional, but it wasn't where deep down as a being I felt I needed to be. You know, there's some moments where I have felt I need to, I don't need to exist in this moment. Like, this is not the room I'm, I'm supposed to be, my consciousness is supposed to be in. And I've just left those rooms. And there's been moments where I, I it's as if it's like a, like, like a ringtone, ding, 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 or like a bell or something. You suddenly feel like your intuition is 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 pointing you and when i trust those moments because for me people think that intuition has to mean a deviation from reality no intuition is just additional information on your reality it's additional it's not replacing and that's the value of life because we are temporary there is no greatness other than releasing whatever the opportunity allows. That means we stopped building the Tower of Babylon that was this tower, this <clears throat> story that uh, pretty much all human beings were united under one language and they decided to build a tower that reached beyond the clouds and as they were getting close human beings were so united under that one language they could work together they could see the same world to build together and they built this tower and the gods noticed the gods noticed and one of the gods was like lightning find my hand and suddenly the other god was like hey man calm down let me show you a classier way. And what that God does is it makes human beings speak different languages so they can't build this ultimate tower to the higher dimensions. Now, here's the thing. We have to build a tower that cannot be broken. A tower that cannot, the language can't break. A language of experience, a language of nature, 
a language that can't be torn apart. You know, people think about life evolving. They don't think about language evolving. If language evolved, your whole story of life would be different. That means it's as if the person's like, all right, I got it. Yeah, non-duality. I got it. Oneness. I got it. Emptiness. But why is the duality here? And why does the infinity symbol exist in our minds? That is the mystery. That you realize, of course, it's, it's like the noob fears the unknown. The novice fears the unknown. Mastery commands fearless attendance to the event. Because now is now. That's the cool thing about life. It's like as it is coming and going, the way our eyes see meaning shifts. So I could say that you right now could have a view on life and you have to realize that some of your ideology is like the weather. It's just like the clouds that are in the sky on that day when you're looking at the world. That's why when I was thinking of, when I started to give these 10,000 talks, I was thinking, like, what do I say? Like, not like that, but I was honestly wondering, like, all right, what, where's the content going to come from? Then I realized, oh, my God, we're living in an unknown universe. <laughs> it's like the whole world is fascinating because it's new to us. And now we have a way to digitally share our findings. For me, what the Internet is, is, is a hunter-gathering a, a society a global society, what, we are, what are we hunting and gathering? Inner realms, attitudes, psychology, display. You know, on some level I was like, yeah, it makes sense, like the poor guy opened the, tour, the poor person opened the, uh, I shouldn't say poor person, <laughs> the person opened the Twitter account and then people came and said harsh things and the person emotionally broke, broke down. On one level I was like, yeah man, yeah, you set yourself up for that, you went to pet a wild grizzly bear. But then on another, on another angle, I'm like, hey, all these people writing down their hated, hatred, writing down all these negative comments, it's a good thing. They are releasing their anger. They are releasing their intensity. They just don't know how to do it in their inner realm, so they have to release it on someone to feel like they released it. Here's the thing. The word divinity just means the unknown is moving the known. There is no such thing as irrationality and rationality, but there is a lot of language floating around here in this world of ours. Don't think people are just walking in streets, in the streets. Language is walking in the streets of their mind as if like, like some programmer coded, like they are their own programmer in accordance to wh where their free will took them in this life. How their walk was being conducted. You know, you can't, anybody who cares about style, there's a reverence to it. There's a sort of something important about your style that your style changes when you are in a bigger audience. That means imagine you were uh, like in a, your style, imagine changing when you are, you know, back in the day in the king's palace at the king's table and, uh, compared to your style where you were in a, I don't know, pub or something like in medieval times or whatever. I'm just saying imagine that narrative. Imagine the how... Um, the room we step in has an intelligence and we are an intelligence and when we wonder about the symb symbiosis of the world and self it is an ever presence of attention it's literally your moment is your moment what are you going to do about it <laughs> it's like the <clears throat> let me tell you in, in 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 i don't know the full story but i know enough to make a point about the story there was um there was this story, at least the idea of, there was this king that one day he dreams, this Indian king. I'm, I'm pretty sure this is, um, I don't know if it's Jenica, but I don't know, I don't know. I don't, it's probably not Jenica, but there's this king <clears throat> that, uh, this king back in the day in Vedic times, 
where this king dreams he's a beggar. Imagine you're a king, a king who sits on a throne and you go sleep in your palace, you know, in, in your, you know, uh, next level, you know, uh, chamber or whatever and you're sleeping but you get it this king got a dream he was a beggar and he woke up shocked he woke up shocked and he went in the mirror sweating and he's like what is this and then he goes and says it to a sage and the sage says the way you're living now your next lifetime you're gonna be a beggar and the king is like, no way, holy shit. <laughs> you know, dodge the bullet there. It was as if the mind was communicating to the self-conscious viewer. Your unconscious is not lifeless. Your unconscious is alive. But the only way you can see it alive is as you. Because I've thought about it. You don't know how many nights I've sat down and I'm like, should, we, should the species entertain metaphysical, the notion of potentials for metaphysical divine agencies? Then I see it from a secular standpoint. I'm like, yeah, it could make a lot of people feel reality is a video game. But then I was like, then I was like if, aliens wanna, if aliens were not physical... And if, like on some level, in a modern way, what was the theological mystery has become now extraterrestrial curiosity. So what I'm saying is, I realize this. Frederick Nietzsche said, man is dead and God killed him. For me, that was like a message in a bottle. That was a warning. That was... That was uh, um, uh, Frederick Nietzsche shouting to philosophers like a backup program that hey they killed the notion that the universe could be alive the next thing they're gonna kill is the unknown they're gonna try to suffocate everything through just a certain shape this is why now more than ever doing something new requires more of a salute than repeating something but if something is new and you, if you want to, you sometimes have to repeat the new to establish it also. So this king, was treating like a beggar to himself. He had a beggar application open in his mind. He had a weakness application open in his psyche. And the... For me, if we wanted to judge the human being, do you know how many mistakes we've made? Do you know, I, do you know if I wanted to uh, criticize history, how many endless talks I could give just being like, look at what they did there, those fools. Look at what they did there, these fools, you know? Like, it, it, like it's so easy to judge the past because it doesn't change. It's harder to comprehend something that is dynamic and set in motion. So what we need is to pilot our attention to an advanced space of communication before we build the civilization. We gotta find, we gotta build the space for the for the emergence of the potential of an advanced civilization in our inner realms before it can even appear in outer realms. For the clouds are always revealing the secret of the void behind them which we think it's void. That means people think the sky is blue, but isn't it interesting that it's dark out there? And we, you might not believe it, but there is a, it's as if like it's two sides of a coin where a what on one level appears as phenomenal for sight, it's also on a level just pure temperature. You know, it's like a kid who uh, has a fever and they're taking the kid's temperature. And it's like that kid now wondering, what is the universe's temperature? Does the universe have a room temperature? Is the universe in greater rooms? You know? Vision. 
pretty much we have outgrown nationalism towards the possibility of global personhood. And global personhood, this is the change. First, it's local, then it's global, then it's galactic, then it's universal. What does that mean? There will come a time where our, our species, it better, <laughs> will reach such advanced heights where we will laugh at the days we thought we could die. We'd be like how, how adorable we were when we were young souls. And of course I'm speaking through the Mystics Canyon. The sign of intelligence is the absence of fear, and it is the absence of fear that is the possibility of imagination. Most people, their minds are inactive because they fear their mind. They, they think they are just the mind. They think they have no choice. The moment you get rid of free will, that's inner extinction. The moment you, you suddenly, that's why I'm saying people's, like they don't need, people don't need psychologists. They just need someone to come up to them and be like, get up. There's work to do. That's it. Ultimate remedy. There is timeless work to do here. Now, the mystical angle, I gotta give, I, I gotta grant the, I gotta honor the voices of those who came before me. And so, to be to include the yogic uh, design in this talk, I have to tell you that for some mystics, like I'm quoting Shirina Sagadad Maharaj, telling you about his ideas. Sh for sh for people like Shri Ramana Maharshi, Sagadad Maharaj, Papaji, the, um, these people, the yogic mind, because it saw greater levels to the world, it wasn't like they were like, don't get caught up in this level. So that's why they had this sense of like, don't get too caught up in this world. There's more to see as a being. <clears throat> and then, on, in my view, I am saying for those who are participating in this 4 billion year science project, whether we like it or not, the system is happening. Now we can update it. That means I'm not saying that this, this realm is truth or other realms are true. I'm saying in some sense that there is something occurring and some people are looking at this thing that's occurring and they don't like it or they want to see something else. And there are some beings that look at it and they're like, all right, if we can update it, why not? Let's see what an advanced civilization looks like. Let's, look, let's see what a civilization looks like where every, if one person falls, there's 8 billion people to lift that person up. Because here, the, let me tell you, the whole point is, it's about the emergence of a global ethos through the events. We, it's like first we were experiencing life as people, now we're experiencing life as communities. Now it's like groups are maturing, not just people. Ideological systems are coming down from their ivory towers. Because why? The future generations deserve the universe's freedom. Not just the freedom that we declare through our language here on earth. It's a coin flip. It's a coin flip, the position of the mind. This is why Rene Descartes, when he spoke about the mind-body dualism, uh, dualism <laughs> the mind-body dualism, what he meant is that the mind is either standing on its own dimension, the mind is like a greater onion layer, whatever you do in this dimension, it's still a property of universal mind, or attributeless just mind. <laughs> An attributeless mind is not per se ent empty because it has the poten it's filled with the potential of attributes. For me, it's like life appears as it is true. Most of physical survival is mechanistic. You understand how the environment works, you get to live in it better. But if you don't understand how the environment, it's the same with your body. Like there was a time where I like, of course, everybody has their vices. But it's like you can have a car, but it doesn't mean it's the perfect car. There's no such thing as a perfect car when new cars are coming out. There's just the perfect enough. 
model. And so I have stared at a candle wondering what is the purpose and the purpose is only on a presence level so I would I feel our linguistic purpose is just for us for our eyes but the existential experiential event that is taking place on this planet is unique because for me before 2011 I wondered I opened up to my inner realms before that it was I became conscious of my inner realms uh, it was more like Everything is normal. Why should I care about updating it? What's wrong with what's going on now? Why should I update it? But it was only when I realized there is nothing normal about 8 billion creatures on a sphere in the middle of nowhere who are wearing uh, watches in a vacuum. There is nothing normal about this. That means there's no such thing as re reality. It was from the beginning surreality. A.K.A. Life is just a dream, you know? <laughs> Linguistically. You can close the applications. You can have moments where your memory becomes full and you got to delete files. There's moments where your, your uh, technology becomes like a telephone to the divine. You know, it becomes an access to other realms. You know, it's all about not just being intelligent but how you use it you could be the greatest violinist but if you're shy what's the point do you think the world likes shy people let me tell you the world should never like shy people and there's a reason to wake them up from the shyness why because we're mortal what what is there to be sh what is there to be shy about what is there to hold back it's happening once every day do you see the freedom I'm talking about? The freedom that's there before you see, uh, before you th create a concept of freedom. It's your allowance of your experience. So, mysticism is putting your phone on pilot mode. That means the applications may be open, but they are not connected to a, a, a sort of um, bigger picture. Do you know that means the language is not the meaning. The language is being used to express the meaning. Therefore, the expression is ne is the effect is never the cause. Because that's why we're calling it an effect. If nothing happened to the cause, the word effect would not exist. The same way, Al again, Albert Einstein says we created time uh, so everything doesn't happen at once, all at once. Do you see? Do you see that we can, just like we hold an object in our hand and we could look at it from different angles, move around the object, what do you think I'm doing in these talks? I'm just doing that with subjects. Subjects I place on a table and I wonder about their design. Because the designer is free. It is only the character in the story that's not free. You know how, like, Uncle Ben, imagine, like, Spider-Man went to buy a canned soup and he suddenly saw Uncle Ben, you know, and he, and he suddenly a tear came to his eye and it was like, with great power comes great responsibility, you know? You know, if I was, if I had Spider-Man's power, I would instantly just go, go into business and make it possible that everybody can, in some sense, navigate like that, you know? <laughs> It's like Spider-Man cared for civilization, but not enough to have himself be tested for an ultimate solution for everybody. <laughs> because really, if we choose to be living beings, soon, the moment you notice yourself as a living being, the question comes, because we're linguistic-based entities. We've, we've opened our eyes in the linguistic simulation. So once you treat yourself like a living being, you're going to wonder about the speed and direction of the living being. The direction is your free will, and the speed is how you navigate after making a choice. There's a saying, they say, don't give your pearls to swine. And I, 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 my, my view was there is no pearls and there is no swine. 
per swine doesn't need pearls. They don't need pearls. Pigs don't need pearls. You know? <laughs> you know, I don't know what kind of, you know, person is giving, giving pearls to swine. I understand the meaning, though, the deeper meaning of it. But the whole notion is whatever amount of pearls we give, it is nothing. It is not the pearl yet. The pearl is the advanced civilization. Everything is just the attempt of the moment. Something in the moment that from the person, personal inner realms brought the person out. They looked at their world. They're like, holy shit. And they're like, now we have to move the advance, advancement of the whole system. I mean, what's the point of being separate in a system? What's the point of United Nations if the nations can't work together? What's the point of it? It just becomes a building. It just becomes a word. It is us that bring, bring, uh, uh, bring it to life, bring the vision to life from the inner realms. That's the whole point of art. For me, art is actually exploration of the inner realms and then expression of it. That means you can read like an artist. When you read, that means you hear the words. It's as if your mind is technically painting a picture to itself. Now, Mr. Within is saying your free will is the hand holding the brush, but you also realize the brush is not your free will. The brush is the world. The canvas is the world. That means it's as if like the person's like, what do I do with emptiness? And, and a voice came out of the void. The voice of the logos came and the logos said, yeah, don't touch it. Don't worry about it. And the person's like, okay. And suddenly the person went to oneness and the person's like, what do I do with oneness? And the voice came and it's like, hey, don't worry about it. You know? Then the person went to duality, and the person's like, oh my god, what do I do? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm being torn apart between chaos and order for eons. And the voice of the logos came, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it, man. It's just part of the event. Just watch it. You're walking in an art gallery. You know, the person walked, and then the person came to the infinite. And the person's like, what do I do with the infinite? You know, and the, again, the voice of the logos came, yeah, don't worry about it, man. Just, just walk past the infinite. You know, then it repeated. The void came. Then there was a pause. The person's like, hey, voice, why am I seeing the void again? And it was there that the logo said, I have been waiting for that question for eons. That when you wonder about your efficient system, that's when paradise can be built on earth. Honor your intelligence. For it's simultaneously being the earth. Anybody who's dishonoring themselves, I mean, you could do something dishonorable and yeah, experience the emotion. Be honest enough when you do something wrong to actually feel that wrong. That means whatever you do in this life, don't forget. The first purpose of it is to be a human being. The second purpose of it is whatever you like. <laughs> so that's the thing. Honor your design. You are technically honoring the world, and the world's going to look at you and be like, yeah, you know, there's, this person's cool. Yeah. <laughs> the guy in mind, the universal sector, aliens are going to be like, nice, human beings are at least honest. It's easy to speak about skydiving, but when you dive in a sky, there's no words. It's just the event is the life of the moment. Be free before you need to be. Much blessings and namaste. I'll see you guys in the Discord server if there's any questions. Blessings. And one last thing. Uh, if you are at, if you have fallen, only thing is left to rise. If you are hopeless in this realm, it is true, you, have, you may be someone who the function of the system is not well. But, regardless, the brush is in your hand still. And life's greater dimensions are no longer finding truth, yet accepting the life of the moment. And as Dylan Thomas says, the ultimate advice to the human being. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage. Rage.
against the dying of the light. You know guys, something I haven't done in a while, which I feel I should do, in, in the earlier talks to 100, to, to the first 200 I would do, where I would do these mantra sessions. So whoever you are just tuning in, <clears throat> this is for the pilot's calling, and to honor the speechless divine. I'll be sharing the mantra of Om and when I say after for the pilot's calling I will be sharing a mantra that has come to me personally which is the word Lida and then I will end off with Om and that's the format if you like, you can choose to tune in. If not, don't forget the brushes in your hand. Pilot where you feel you need to be. For the pilot's calling.
Rise, mankind, rise. <laughs> 